When he was born, Pearl Harbor was just three weeks away. When he was growing up, baseball was the central part of a life in Arundaquart that also included bikes and beaches. When he graduated, he left behind a high school world that balanced skill on the diamond and prejudice in the hallways. And when he entered the world of business, he found that a little research and a lot of hours could make a good idea into a billion dollar company. With that success has come the time to take on other challenges, notably the fights against drug abuse and teenage pregnancy, and for a third political party. Now, Tom Gullisano talks with Bill Pierce about the Rochester he knows. Hey. Hi, I'm Bill Pierce. Welcome to the Rochester I know. Tom Gullisano, great to have you here. Read about you all the time, hear about the important things you're doing in this community, but uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about your background, where you come from, and something about your family. In the opening, it said you grew up in, in Arondequoit. Uh, mm -hmm. no, were your parents uh, born in Arondequoit? Where did they come from? My mother was born right here in Rochester and lived yeah. in Geneva and Leroy, but mainly her and her parents settled right here in town. My father was born in a town in Sicily and mm -hmm. migrated to this country mm -hmm. with, along with his mother in 1905. He was mm -hmm. seven years old. It's sort of an interesting story around that. My father was the youngest of six, and the eldest was his sister, of course a daughter, mm -hmm. and she married a merchant here in Rochester. And I, so she came over earlier. She came over first because mm -hmm. she had gotten to know this merchant, this, this business person here. Who, what, who was commuting between here and yeah, Sicily? He, that's correct. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. uh, so married him? I married him, and uh -huh. then one by one, they were able to bring the elder brothers over through bribing custo or immigration officials. And, of course, they came through Im Ellis Island. And my father, being the youngest, uh, they came over last. He came over last with his mother when he was seven years old. His father had died in a sulfur mine uh, accident before in, he was born. In Sicily? In Sicily. Yeah. So I had never known my grandfather yeah. on that side. So your dad, and that would be your grandmother, because your, your father's mother came over together. Right. And, and they, they came here as a result of bribing customs officials? Immigration officials. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's how you expedited the process really? back in those days. You could get over eventually, but if you, you what? You, yeah. it, was, it was money, I presume. You had yeah. to pay them something. Yeah, yeah they, they paid them a stipend to uh -huh. expedite the process to get them uh -huh. over and get them over in a fairly timely manner. Yeah. And, of course, then my father met my mother here in, right here in Rochester. Uh -huh. My father was about seven or eight years older than she was. Uh -huh. And they got married, settled down in the in the Clinton Avenue, Joseph Avenue neighborhood uh -huh. near the railroad bridge. Uh -huh. Okay, uh -huh. and then eventually, when I was a youngster, like now that was a that was that was an Italian area. Oh yeah, it was area. a very Italian yeah. area yeah. there. And, you know, a, yeah. a lot of the business conducted was in the form of retail food, grocery uh -huh. stores, and uh -huh. garment shops, and all that type of thing. Uh -huh. And uh, my father worked at uh, at Kodak for a while and uh -huh. at Hawkeye. And had some other sales jobs. He eventually yeah. became a heating contractor yeah. in the in the 40s after the war and early yeah. 50s. That was the time when all the furnaces and homes were coal, yeah. and somebody had developed these gas and oil conversions. Oh, well, we remember shoveling coal. Oh yeah, <laughs> and there was a big business converting those yeah. things to gas yeah. and oil furnaces. And, and your dad was in that business. And he did that converting. for quite a few years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I said during the time we moved out to Rundy quite. Uh -huh. And uh, myself and my uh, sister, older sister and older brother. Now, Arondequoit well, is what, yeah. just a couple miles further, what, out Clinton? Or? Yeah, we just uh, moved basically three or four miles uh, north towards the lake across Ridge Road. And well, we, we, now, this is where? In the, this is in the 50s? Yeah, this would be in the uh, late 40s, early late, 50s. Early 40s. Yeah. Now, what was Arondequoit like then? Well, Runnequoit was much a uh, country town. I mean, uh, my parents were able to find lots to build two different homes as owners. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of open land back in Runnequoit in those days. It was just starting to flourish. Mm -hmm. I think the, the principal commerce area was Titus and Cooper still, yeah. and they built the old high school and then the new high school in that area. But it was very much, uh, Runnequoit was considered the country yeah. uh, back in those days. and. I guess uh, as a matter of accomplishment, it was, a, it was a big deal to be able to move north of Ridge Road and close mm -hmm. to the lake. And so, consequently, I spent so a lot of time. So you were a successful <laughs> family. <so. laughs> well, we, I, I'd okay. say our family was yeah. fairly successful, yeah. uh, but we did have a couple of incidents that happened uh, in our lives and in, in our family life that kind of changed things around. My, I had a brother that was killed in Korea mm -hmm. during that war, and it seemed to have a very profound effect on my yeah. father. Uh, an older brother, obviously. Yeah, he was yeah. 11 years older. His name was Charles. Uh, was that your dad's name, Charles? Uh, no. My father's name was Samuel. My mother's uh -huh. name was Anna. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, uh, and Charles, was, was he in the Army or Marines? Or? Army. 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 And he was 21 years old and 
uh, mm -hmm. during that Korean conflict. Mm -hmm. Of course, they were drafting people, yeah. and um, mm -hmm. he got involved in that, and uh, he was only over there about 11 months. And he was an older brother. Ten years older. Ten years older, yeah. so obviously yeah. someone you dead, uh, loved. Yeah, you know. my father was very close to him, and, you know, mm -hmm. and like most families, I mean, losing a, a son or a daughter mm -hmm. is a very traumatic experience, mm -hmm. and my, mm -hmm. my brother and my father were extremely close. And mm -hmm. After that happened, I think my father's life changed dramatically, and even his relationship with my mother changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things became financially very difficult, and, uh, you know, to the point where, you know, they came and got the car, mm -hmm. and we were in danger of losing the house at one time. Now, this was when I was a sophomore, junior, and senior in high mm -hmm. school. It was a fairly traumatic experience yeah. for me. And you're old enough to sense what's going on, and, and it's, yeah. it's a little tough. What were your high school days like? Uh, high school for me was, I was one of those students, I guess I was a, a B plus A type of student doing C work. Oh. Uh, high school to me was uh, more of an activity where I could center around, mm -hmm. you know, going out and playing baseball and, yeah. and meeting people and all those types of things. Yeah. So I, I stayed straight and narrow, though, yeah. but I just wasn't a, a dedicated, yeah. devoted uh, student. So what, now what did you do? Well, you're a high school student in Irondequoit. We're talking 50s now. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you're interested in baseball. Did you go to Silver Stadium to watch baseball? Oh, games? absolutely. It was yeah. called Red Wing Stadium back then. In uh -huh. fact, what I used to do, I used to ride my bike up to so Red Wing Stadium. Yeah. I used to sit behind the right field fence and wait for one of the players to home run. Uh -huh. And if I could capture that ball before anybody else did, they'd let us into the game. Did you ever get it? Oh, sure. I got it yeah. many times. And yeah. sometimes I kept it just to you yeah. know, play catch with. Uh -huh. If we didn't get a home run ball, we were able yeah. to go in at the end of the seventh inning. The ushers all got to know us. Yeah. So I kind of lived around Red Wing Stadium. Yeah. In fact, one of my biggest thrills in life was playing a high school championship game there when yeah. I was in, uh, playing for Ronnie Quite High School in 1959. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what did you play? I played the outfield. Outfield. Center field, left yeah. field, right field. Uh, left, left and right. Left and right. Yeah, the, yeah. the Muxworthy kid from Rundy quite yeah. played center. We, in fact, we still played ball together up until two years ago. Really? Uh, and uh, yeah. I still play. Old ball so. players never die. Yeah, we just we just can't get it out of our blood. I mean, obviously our reflexes aren't the same, and we don't yeah. cover as much ground. Yeah, we're going to we go on to that in a minute, but I don't want to leave Arundaquoit because we we skipped yeah. over you know yeah. elementary school. Was that yeah. in the city and in Arundaquoit? No, I went to elementary school Jose or Rogers, which was right off Seneca Avenue, uh -huh. and uh, it was walking distance, or you rode your yeah. bicycle. Uh -huh. It was uh, K through six. Yeah. And then in those days, Arundaquoit High School had a f had the seventh and eighth grade housed, housed mm -hmm. right in it. Mm -hmm. So a seventh grader went to basically school with mm -hmm. high school people right yeah. through the senior year. Yeah. So that yeah. was a, a little bit of a walk. But it was a very, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, close knit, warm community. Yeah. Do, now, any of the any of the people you went to school with, any of your classmates in high school or elementary school, still around? Still people you know and work with? Or? Well, quite frankly, about yeah. three or four of them ended right. up being equity partners or franchisees of Paychex. Uh, right. One of them moved to Denver, Colorado. One moved to Atlanta, G Georgia. Another one moved to Cincinnati, G uh, Gene Palacini. Yeah. And we're involved, and some of them are still very much involved in Paychex. Uh, yeah. It's funny, my two or three closest friends in high school are my two or three closest friends now. Which, uh, which now, I think that, was there a gulf in between? I mean, did they no, did we, you just keep in touch? We all just on? stayed together all these years, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll tell you, I think it's one of been one of the real pluses in my life yeah. because I think too many people don't have those close associations yeah. for so many years. Well, now that you, there's so much transition in, in schools, you know, but uh, yeah. I'm sure when you, when you went to school, you start probably started in elementary school, went right through high school with very with very yeah. much the same people. Exactly right. So exactly you build right. up those friendships it that was last a, you know, a lifetime. Yeah. It was a far less transient society uh -huh. back then than it yeah. is today. Well, now we're getting in towards <laughs> moving toward the transient society. Yeah. You're in a cha you're playing in a championship uh, team at Arundaquite High School. Mm -hmm. You're playing in Red Wing Stadium now. Did, does your career end there? Well. Right after that, I was invited to a training camp by the Cleveland Indians, and really? uh, yeah. I, I went to it. And where was that? They held it in Batavia, where they uh -huh. have a farm team, or had uh -huh. a farm team at the time. They, they put me up against the right field fence, and they hit long fly balls to me to see if I could throw it a home in third base, and yeah. I could do that okay. Yeah. And then they uh, lined us up in a straight line, and we had to run the 40-yard dashes to see how quick we were in the 40-yard dash, yeah. and I was in the top 5 or 10% of that, really? but then got us up to bat, could he hit with power? And that's where I fell apart. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I decided that uh, baseball okay. has been a lot of fun, and I should make yeah. it strictly recreational. Yeah. And I better get on with other serious things. It had to be power. It didn't. It didn't make any difference if you could just get some nice clean singles. Uh, they were looking for hitting with they power. They were looking for. Yeah. Power but yeah, I, I think if you could hit with power at that yeah. level, then yeah. maybe you could be a good singles hitter at that yeah. level, at the upper level. Well, that had to be a great thrill for you to be oh, it was a great to be thrill. scouted by the Cleveland Indians and actually yeah. try out. I mean, that's. It's every kid's dream, whether they make it or not, to try oh, out for the big and, leagues. And, yeah. and being part of a team that won a county championship was also yeah. a very big yeah. thrill. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question about well, that. Well, you've become part of many teams since then. Now, we're out. You've, your baseball career is over, <laughs> uh, except yeah. that it isn't, I guess. You're still, <laughs> yeah. still throwing the ball around. Uh, you go on to college. Well, there was sort of a gap. I, right. Because I was sort of a nondescript student yeah, in high school, yeah. when I got out of high school, I, you know, I kind of looked around. I didn't yeah. even take my SAT school, uh, yeah. test. And so I kind of settled in around the house for a couple of weeks, and I went out and applied for a few jobs. And, of course, back in those days, if you could apply mm -hmm. and get accepted at Kodak, I mean, it was cradle-to-grave yeah. security, and that was every parent's dream back mm -hmm. in those days. Well, they didn't accept me. Uh, in fact, I don't even think they interviewed me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I sat around the house for well, a couple of weeks. That was their loss. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I don't know how well I would have yeah. fit into that. Yeah, well, but anyway, yeah, yeah. sat around the house for a couple of weeks, yeah. and I went to my father one day, and I said, you know, what do I do now? And he yeah. said, well, you, I better help you find a job, don't yeah. you think? And I said, yeah. yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. So he knew somebody, a vice president of operations at uh, Lincoln Rochester Trust Company at the mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. and now Chase Lincoln, of course. And he got me an interview, and I went up, and they, they hired me, and my first mm -hmm. job was down in the vault in the lower level, no windows. Uh, this is a vault with a big steel a vault, door? big with, steel doors, and yeah. this was a little ante room yeah. off the side. Yeah. Yeah. And the department stores, uh, Sears, Edwards, McCurdy's, Sibley's, yeah. would all bring in their cash deposits. And it was my job to take a uh, wrapper fill of uh, bills with singles, fives, tens, or twenties, and there would always be 50 in the wrapper, take the wrapper off, make sure there were 50 bills in it, mm -hmm. put the wrapper back on, put my stamp on, and then do the next package. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did for about three months, and I said to myself, something's wrong with this, <laughs> yeah, especially at $47 a week. <laughs> <laughs> and you're uh, counting out probably millions of dollars. I was probably cutting out, counting about one hundred dollars to $200,000 a day, which really? was a lot of money in those yeah. days. And I yeah. said, something's wrong with this picture, not to coin yeah. an overused yeah. phrase. So I decided maybe I better go to college. And I had a couple of friends that had gone to Alfred Tech. They seemed to like it. So I went down there and applied, mm -hmm. and they said, yeah, we'll, we'll take you in Golisano, but we want you to wait till the following September. Mm -hmm. So back to the vault, I went uh, counting that money, and then one day, Bill, I got to tell you, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And I, and I picked up my personal <laughs> things, and I walked up to, the, to, the, to my supervisor, and, and I said, look, at, I, I'm crying. I said, I just can't go back to that room anymore. I've got to do something different. So he was nice enough to say, go home for a couple days, oh, and uh, I'll call wow. you. And he called me up in a couple of days, and he said, come on in, we'll make you a teller uh, wow. at, at the downtown location, which was, you know, quite a, quite a promotion at wow. the time. He, and, he, and they did that even knowing I was going to college. And so you got out of the vault, you could get up where you could yeah. see daylight. Yeah. yeah. My most unusual experience in that, uh, in that being the teller at, at Lincoln at the time was having Judge Andy Sully. I don't know if you know Judge Sully. Yes, remember yes, Judge Sully. Yes, walk yeah. in with a counterfeit $20 bill, and I caught it. Really? <laughs> I don't know where he got it. I never asked him, of course. But I, I remember was that Was he experience. a little startled when you confronted I, yeah, him? Yeah, he was a little little startled yeah. you know, and yeah. surprised. Well, no, Judge Sully was a well-known yeah. figure in this community for a long, yeah. long time and well-respected. Yeah. But to be caught with a counterfeit bill, that was yeah. something. That was amazing. Yeah. Now you go on from... Your, um, your teller, but obviously that banking experience must have helped you somewhat. You know, I think it did help. Uh, first of mm -hmm. all, I met a lot of nice, interesting people, yeah. and it yeah. gave me s at least one perspective on yeah. what goes on in the business yeah. world. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think just the exposure to the different types of management mm -hmm. styles and supervisory styles was very, very mm -hmm. helpful. But I went on to college down at Alfred Tech, down mm -hmm. the southern tier of New York State, took business. Mm -hmm. uh, first year, I was a very dedicated student. I was a little nervous that I wasn't going to be successful. Yeah. And so I worked very hard and became a dean's list. I mean, they didn't believe that exactly. back at Arundiquite High School. So you were a C student in Arundiquite, and you yeah. became dean's list at Alfred. Alfred. A least, late bloomer. A late bloomer, or <laughs> somebody just decided to get serious. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, graduated after two years, considered yeah. going to Albany State. In fact, I applied uh, to, get a, to become a teacher because wow. the head of the accounting department at Alfred mm -hmm. uh, did me the honor of asking yeah. me. He says, if you go on to Albany, graduate, yeah. and come back, we'll hire you. At Alfred ah, Tech. Mm -hmm. and I thought, boy, that was quite a... Now, you would go to Albany, what, for graduate work? For two or three years, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, 
and he would be willing to hire me back. I used mm -hmm. to work for him part-time. Uh -huh. He had a part-time accounting practice, and I used to do bank reconciliations for him on Saturday morning. Uh -huh. It was always my desire to catch him in a mistake. I could never do really? it. The guy was great. That was a little college money, I think. Yeah, it was a little college money. A little uh, walking around money, which yeah. is probably desperately needed. <laughs> then. Hmm. It was survival money, quite yeah. frankly. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're, you're, you're at Alfred, but your family is still in Arondequoit. Are you yeah. back and forth quite a bit? I was a weekend student. I uh, came home almost every weekend. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know why. I think it was probably had something to do with I preferred dating working girls rather than oh, college really? girls. Oh. I, I really don't know why. Nothing to do with mama's cooking. Uh, in laundry facilities, probably. Laundry. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Uh, the thing that was so unique, and I talked uh -huh. to my stepboys about this all the time, is I used to hitchhike back and forth to school, to yeah. college, yeah. and even sometimes to high school. And I tell them about that experience, and they look at me and say, hitchhike, what's that? Yeah. And it was a very traditional yeah. method of transportation back in those days. But it's yes, not anymore, I think obviously. we all remember hitchhike. I once hitchhiked across this country. Oh, that's <laughs> great hitchhike. It was yeah, a great way to no, travel. No, absolutely no fears whatsoever. Yeah. And it was it, cheap. It's never, I'll say it was cheap. Yeah. It, was, <laughs> it was zero expenses. That yeah. was a yeah, marvelous yeah. experience. You're out of college. We want to get you to paychecks. We want to find out how that developed. Yeah, there, were, there were a couple steps in between. I yeah. went to work uh, for Monroe Savings Bank. I was there for a couple of years. Uh, as a teller? Uh, well, I had a little more responsibility than that. I had mm -hmm. what was known as a desk on the platform. I used to take mortgage applications. I sold, sold savings mm -hmm. bank life insurance. I was in charge of the tellers. And I used to go out to some of the branches when the managers were on vacation. Mm -hmm. In fact, the reason they hired me, I started at the Goodman Plaza office, mm -hmm. which is in North Goodman Street near Maine. Mm -hmm. And it was a predominantly an Italian neighborhood then. And they hired me because I could ah, at least yeah, communicate yeah. somewhat uh -huh. with, with the, some of their Italian customers. But eventually they moved me downtown. Uh, one day, uh, my wife's uh, brother, who uh, was going to RIT, came into my house one day and said, uh, Tom, he says, I need your advice on something. And his name was Niall. He was younger than me. And he says, Tom, he says, I just got offered this co-op job at Cybron Corporation and I'm going to be doing this, this, and this. He said, my question is, they're, they're going to pay me $110 a week. Mm -hmm. Now, I had a now wife. Now, a co-op job means what? He's in school, school part-time, and part-time at right. Cybron. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a wife with a child and one more child on the way, uh. and I've been working for two years, and he says to me, he's going to make $110 a week, <laughs> and I look at my paycheck, and I'm making 97 <laughs> That was a fairly dramatic day and, and change in my life on that day oh. because the following Monday I resigned from the bank and decided I was going to get into a sales position uh -huh. because I thought the future would be better. And I ended up working for Burroughs Corporation. Uh -huh. Not the old Todd division that produced forms, mm -hmm. but the, the group Is that it provided... Burroughs used to be on University Avenue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That used to be the group that mm -hmm. uh, printed forms uh -huh. and sold them throughout the country. I went to work for the equipment division. All they had here was a branch office, mm -hmm. and I sold accounting machines that did uh -huh. payroll and general ledger and inventory. Kind of the forerunner of PCs. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's mm -hmm. exactly right. And yeah. when people talk about doing payroll on PCs, yeah. they were doing that back in the yeah. 60s. They just on called these, them accounting machines. On these big Burroughs machines uh, they, with about three million buttons on them. They were big and heavy <laughs> and ugly <laughs> and complicated. Uh, but uh, that's, that's what we sold in those uh, days. And uh, that's when I got introduced. You to sold those machines. Now, do you sell them you know, what, just area-wide or country-wide? Uh, well, Burroughs sold them all over the country. I had a mm -hmm. territory which was basically the northwest part of the city uh -huh. and Brock, out to Brockport. Mm -hmm. And it was a very interesting experience, too. So you building. learned a lot of small businesses, I presume. You got it. Exactly. And that, uh, I'm beginning to see now how it all is beginning to fit, yeah. to, beginning to fit together. Yeah. The experience at Burroughs uh -huh. was very important because exposed me to a lot of small business people. I got uh -huh. to be able to make assessments on what made them successful or what uh -huh. made them not so mm -hmm. successful, what type of work ethics they had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just general characteristics. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was making a living, of course, but the real thing I was really doing was trying to absorb as much of this as I could mm -hmm. because I think I always had in the back of my mind I want to start my own business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, it's a little known fact, but after my Burroughs experience, I did start another business. It was called Bitter's Guide. B I D D. Bidders Guide? Yeah. Who uh, would the bidders be? Uh, well, in New York State, as in most states, mm -hmm. any municipality or school district that purchases anything over $1,000 or $2,500, uh -huh. whatever it may be now, uh, has to advertise for bids in a newspaper mm -hmm. publication. Yes. So I got this idea of subscribing to every newspaper in New York State. So, and these bids are in what? All these. Weeklies. Local and daily, yeah. daily and weekly weeklies, newspapers. Daily newspapers. Yeah. Uh, there were 53 weeklies, er, 53 dailies, and 375 weeklies. 
And they all came to a post office box. At now, the, how did you find this out? Well, when I was selling for Burroughs, I sold a machine to the village of Churchville to do water billing. Uh -huh. And when I, I had made the sale, but I didn't have a signed order. And when I came back to the branch office, my manager said, where are they going to advertise for bids on this machine? And I uh -huh. said, what? He says, well, they have to advertise for bids in a yeah. newspaper. He said, encourage them to advertise in the Churchill paper. And where, I said... Where no one will see it? Right, where no one will see it. And I said, gee, that's a great idea. And then, then my mind started moving, and I said, I wonder how many times the competition does that to us. So I got this idea, yeah. uh, and I eventually left Burroughs yeah. and started this company called Bitter's Guide, spent two years traveling around New York State selling subscriptions to this. Now, this is a, this is a, a weekly or a Three monthly? Three times a week. Three times a week, mm -hmm. it's a newspaper or a magazine. It was you know. a mimeographed, <laughs> stapled <laughs> pieces of paper. <laughs> but companies at the time were paying, you know, anywhere from 90 to 180 to $200 a year for the service uh -huh. because it was a real, you know, sales aid or uh, management. And thing. all the bids were put together in your, and that was I the first time that was ever done? Uh, as far as I know, yes. Is anyone doing it now? Well, about a year ago, I found out that Bidder's Guide is still going because I sold it. Mm -hmm. to start paychecks. Oh, okay. that's where you got this, the startup money. For now, between boroughs and paychecks, we got to get the paychecks or we'll never get there. <laughs> you, you worked for one other company. Uh, I went to work for Electronic Accounting Systems. Which okay. was, kind of did the same kind yeah. of thing that paychecks is doing right. today. Right, EIS was a payroll processing firm. Mm -hmm. They very much targeted their services towards larger companies like 50 to 500 employees. And I was working for them as a salesperson and a sales management person that I got the idea for paychecks. Mm -hmm. Most of the payroll processors back then were targeting their services at larger size companies. Mm -hmm. And the mentality was the larger the company, the more revenue, the better off the payroll mm -hmm. processor was concerned mm -hmm. there was going to be. But when you travel down Main Street anywhere in America, most businesses have less than 50 employees. In yeah. fact, literally, the statistic is 93% have less than 50 employees. And you did the research to find this out, too. I, I went to the library. <laughs> My high school librarian would probably roll over in her grave if yeah. she knew uh, the information. It's amazing how much information is in libraries oh, that we yeah. don't capitalize on. Oh, yeah. absolutely. You start your own company with the money you got from selling out the bidder's guide. Absolutely. Which was, paychecks were started with how much? Well, by the time I paid off all the debt I had incurred starting Bidder's Guide, and, and all I had left for the formation of Paychex was $3,000. So Paychex was formed with $3,000. And, and did you have a partner or anything? Well, no, I didn't. I started by myself. I tried to have a partner. One of the people that I was very close to in high school who still is who's now involved with Paychex was a fellow by the name of Gene Palacini. Grew up in Arundiquai. Gene was running a, or managing a tire store in, in Webster, and I went out to see Gene, and I said, Gene, you know what I do for EAS. I said, there's a whole new marketplace here for smaller type companies. I've got $3,000. You come up with $3,000 and come in with me on it. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, Gene kind of looked at me and said, I don't think it'll work. Mm -hmm. uh, five years later, Gene became a franchisee of Paychex, moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. And obviously, it was very successful. If then. you wanted to get into paychecks today, what would it cost? <laughs> <laughs> Everything is company owned today. <laughs> Everything is company we're, owned. We'll go back to paychecks in a minute, but we're getting close to the end. And I, and I want to bring up a couple of other okay. things. Tom Galasano, you're one of the, the many people that I admire in this community, but one of the things I admire most is your, your willingness to, to, as a CEO of a, a major emerging company, to, to stand up on and be outspoken on local issues that you know affect all of our lives. And I know how much work you've done on the substance abuse. And I think your leadership there has been really important. I don't know yeah. how you, where you think that's going today and how you feel about it. Well, there the, are the two areas I've been very concerned with. Substance abuse, obviously, is one of them, teenage pregnancy. Back yeah. to substance abuse. We have put a tremendous amount of effort into fighting substance abuse. And, you know, it's been called a war as, a, as sort of an acronym. We're not winning it. As a matter of fact, I think we're losing it. Uh, the numbers that continue to perpetuate themselves for substance abuse and addiction are extremely high. And, and it's not limited to just, my feelings are not just limited to illegal drugs, but also the drugs of alcohol and cigarettes. What are we going to do about it? Well, I have some theories, I, you know, and a lot of people disagree with me, but I, I think if you want to cut down on consumption and addiction, that you have to cut down or create an environment where the marketing systems and the sales systems don't work as well. 
I mean, the alcohol industry spends $4 billion a year. And the average 21-year-old in New York State sees 100,000 beer commercials by the time they're 21. Now, should we be surprised that there's this mm -hmm. pent-up demand? Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that bothers me most about it is if they sold beveraging mm -hmm. instead of drugging, mm -hmm. and by drugging I'm changing your emotional state and your, your mental state, mm -hmm. uh, I would feel better about it. But mm -hmm. actually they're, they're advertising very targeted at young mm -hmm. people, and they're not selling beveraging, they're selling mm -hmm. drugging. Yeah. Uh, I wish we could do something about that. Mm -hmm. Tom Galasano, you've done a marvelous job in this community, not only in bringing about a company that's very important to this community, but also your willingness to step out on local community mm -hmm. issues like the substance abuse and teenage pregnancy. And I wish we had more time <laughs> to talk about some of these things. We didn't get to them, but your stories about growing up in Rochester and, and your experiences are just marvelous. And I and, uh, hope mm -hmm. you come back again so we can get to some of, the, it was some, a lot of the, fun. some of the other areas because you're wonderful to talk to. I'm Bill Pierce. This is the uh, Rochester I Know. The guest today has been Tom Galasano, founder, present CEO of Paychex uh, Company, and uh, we're, we're very happy to have you here, Tom. See you next time on the Rochester I Know. So long for now. Thank you. Thank you.